Thank you for the warm welcome here this morning. It's lovely to be back in Brannock's town again. Uh, for those that don't know, my name's Jonathan, and there's a photo up there of me, Janet, my wife, and our children. In fact, we work with a faith mission down in County Cork, though the picture might be slightly out of date because our eldest son, Paul, moved to Donegal in September and now lives with his grandparents up there and uh, has a job up there and is working up there. So we miss him. Uh, we do see him and uh, up in Donegal. So it's all the way the opposite ends of the, of the country, um, quite quite far away. Uh, but but no, so that's, that's where we are. And down in County Cork, the Faith Mission is blessed to have a camp centre. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, this actually isn't what it looks like now. I don't ever remember it looking like this, but it used to be a farm. And so it was a farmyard with a barn and things like that. Um, but if we go on to the next slide, you can see what it is now. So that's the same sort of place, different angle. <laughs> this was a drone shot. Somebody was at the centre and used had a drone, so they took a good, nice aerial photograph of it. Um, but as you can see, there's a playing area, there's a sports hall, there's a d accommodation, there's dining room and meeting room and things like that. In fact, on the next slide, it shows a few of the things that we have in it, um, the different rooms and spaces. But it's great facilities to have and to use for camps in the summer, residential youth weekends and things like that uh, throughout the year at other times and convention and other things like that. There's a fair bit of uh, practical work to keep it uh, going and uh, up, 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 up keep it, I suppose, but um, but it's good facilities to have. And on the next slide, please, um, the little cottage is part of the original building. The dining room, actually, the walls are part of the original barn um, that's been re-roofed. You probably wouldn't recognise it as a barn now. Um, but this is a, a cottage. It used to be stables, actually. Um, but it's a like, nice sort of self-catering um, cottage that's there that groups can use as accommodation um, or other things, or, or, you know, if they need it extra space. Um, on the next slide, it has some of the things we have, camps, Bible study groups, clubs. We do a weekly children's club there. Um, there's youth groups use it and other things. But it's so nice to hear or to see um, when you've been at camps of people trusting the Lord as their saviour. Or when groups go, uh, one youth leader said, so many of our young people met with God this weekend or actually responded and took a step of faith. And that's really amazing and really great that God speaks to people and it's a place that people can meet and hear his word and actually come to know him. And it means so much for so many people where that was where they trusted the Lord for themselves. We know God can work anywhere and everywhere, don't we? You know, wherever we are. But it's so special when, when it's a place that is used for that purpose and you can see people responding in faith to it. Um, on the next slide, if, if you wanted to come down and see it, you'd be welcome to. Um, the Dune Bank holiday weekend, uh, we have a convention. In fact, the photos there are from about five years ago, I think. I didn't get to up update that, but the dates are there um, for this year, Friday the 2nd to Monday the 5th of June. Um, one of the speakers is Jonathan Curry. He's a, he's a minister of the Presbyterian Church in Kilkenny um, at the minute. Um, but he's a, he's a, got a real ministry of the word. And so if you wanted to come down for the weekend, you'd be welcome to. There's activities for children. Um, on site and fellowship and the meetings as well. We're involved in a few other things as well. So if you have the next slide, um, there's some photos from camps and some of the things we've got up to at camps. So you have the meetings and the fun, the activities and things like that. We do two weeks of camp ourselves at uh, residential camps. Um, and then it's used by other groups for camps in the summer as well. In fact, just a few weeks ago, we had uh, some youth weekends. It was good to have the young people uh, together from camps, like a camp reunion again. And on the next next one, please. We do, so we do a weekly children's club at the, at the centre um, on a Tuesday afternoon uh, for young people, boys and girls, national school age, I suppose, to come along um, and to have fun and to hear the word of God. And then we also do a, a weekly club in, a, in an estate called Deer Park. That's in Bandon. I suppose a, a housing estate, really, um, where most children wouldn't come from church going families um different backgrounds um and so numbers can fluctuate quite a bit at this club uh, but it's quite good to see the boys and girls coming along and hearing his word but then just being national school age some of them didn't want to leave it so we started a youth club there sort of straight afterwards for slightly older ones in fact we had an age group for that but there's a few who are still a bit too old but they still want to keep coming so 
uh, you don't want to turn them away. So we do a children's club and a youth club. But in fact, about a month ago, um, some of them were asking about having a Bible because they didn't have a Bible. Some of the young people. So Janet got Bibles for about five of them who'd asked specifically for them. Well, then there were others who wanted Bibles. So she took some more the next week. And in all, about a dozen Bibles were given away to these young people. Um, Janet wrote in them and gave them to them. And so they'll treasure them. And in fact, there was one lady told us just recently that she went along to a club like that and she was given a Bible and she treasured it. It was so special. It had been written in and she, she, she read it or, or read parts of it anyway. And it was through that that she found faith herself and actually followed the Lord. And so, and then in fact, a couple of weeks ago, one of the young people came and said, my granny saw my Bible and she doesn't have a Bible and she would like a Bible. So could she get a Bible? So, so Janet took a Bible along for her granny. So it's the young people and granny <laughs> have been given Bibles, but uh, it's good to know that the word of God has been gone out to, to um, people in those situations. Um, so we do value prayer for that club. And um, particularly we, we did see that often it was when people from such as that estate or that club would come to camps, that that's when you saw a big change in their lives. Whether in that Christian environment for more than just an hour a week or however long it would be for the club, but um, but at camps, that they actually responded and realized the reality of the things of God. Um, so we do value prayer for that. There's other things we, we do as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to have the next slide, please. Janet's involved in ladies' ministry. Um, she was a chef before she went to Bible college. Um, her dad asked me if that was, was why I married her. <laughs> I suppose he could get away with that. <laughs> um, I think he was joking, by the way. <laughs> um, but but she uses that for, I suppose, camps and convention and things, but also does a ladies' outreach um, occasionally. She used to do it every other month. Um, it's been slightly less frequently, more recently. Um, but something that ladies can invite their friends to see a cookery demonstration and enjoy tasting it and eating it with supper uh, with ladies afterwards. And usually somebody shares their testimony at those events. She has relationships with a few other ladies who um, she knows. One lady in particular doesn't know the Lord yet, but she meets with her occasionally and uh, quite often actually. But um, do pray for this lady. Um, she often has prayer requests and has seen answers to those prayers. Um, but pray for her salvation. And there's another lady she meets with who has a difficult life, um, but knows the Lord and walks with him, but needs his help day by day, as indeed don't we all. Um, but we know that the Lord is a real help in time of need. Um, so do pray for Janice for the, the, the ladies and the Bible study she does. She does a Bible study and things as well uh, with ladies too. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, we have a book stall which comes out at convention, but then at Christmas time or November, December time, we have a book stall and have it for about a week. And uh, quite a number of people come along and enjoy the fellowship and get good Christian literature to give away to people. In fact, somebody asked to see Janet the other day to get some Bibles for her grandchildren who live in Australia. And um, so they're being sent out for Christmas <laughs> and it's March. <laughs> um, I suppose they'll get there on time, won't they? But, um, but there's a good ministry there to share uh, good, good literature with people. Thank you. And there's been various theme nights at different points as well. Um, and then we do a monthly outreach lunch. Um, we invite people along to uh, to enjoy their dinner and have a, have a word from the Lord uh, shared at that too. And the next slide, please. Then um, we've done a Christmas outreach meal. Everyone likes Christmas dinners, don't they? And um, so there's been good crowds coming along and some neighbours have come along to those sort of events as well um, where they enjoy the Christmas dinner and have a word particularly relevant to that time of year uh, being shared. We've also done some family fun days usually at the start of the year, to kickstart clubs and other things regularly um, that have gone fairly well and some neighbours and people have been along at those. But then recently we started some a couple of things a bit different, if we can have the next slide. Um, one is a gospel hymn sing evening. We thought in the evenings there weren't, wasn't so much happening on a Sunday evening. Um, so I thought like a praise night. And then with some local musicians, have had them coming along to play and uh, had some... We've only had one of them so far, but it was good to see attendance from a wide area coming along, enjoying singing and uh, the ministry. And we shared a thought at that as well about one of the hymns uh, that we sang. We've got another one of those planned in April and other things too. But instead of the family fun day, we thought we'd do like a breakfast. Then we thought, well, actually a breakfast, maybe people might be 
might not want to get up too early on Saturday. So we then thought about lunch, but then thought, well, that's in the middle of the day. It breaks up the whole day. So we went for a brunch. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to compromise, isn't it? <laughs> So we went in the middle, um, so you don't know whether you're meant to have breakfast beforehand or have all three, you know, breakfast and brunch and lunch. Um, but, but we had, had a brunch. Um, and there was a few came along the first time, but then the last time we had it, about a month ago, more and more people kept booking in, and it got to about over 80 people came along to the dining room and enjoyed having brunch, and uh, families and children all seeming to enjoy the, the fellowship. So a few people asked us when the next one is, we are planning them sort of quarterly, I think, we thought, rather than uh, too often. Um, but, um, but there's been opportunities to invite neighbours or people along to come to different events. And most importantly, to hear something of God's word shared, that they can, can encounter God speaking to them through his word and show them that he is real, that he does love them and calls them to come and to follow him, that they can know the joy of their sins forgiven and of knowing God with them uh, throughout the journey of life and have his help day by day. Is that the last slide? Thank you. I was, I was thinking what was next, but <laughs> obviously that's it. But uh, thank you very much for your uh, interest in us in the work of the Faith Mission and also for the activities and opportunities we have. We thank you very much for your prayers for us. Uh, for without him, without God, we can do nothing. As so we do, thank you. I encourage you to keep praying both for us and for other missionaries, as we've already uh, already been mentioned in prayer as well, that God's word would go forth with his blessing, with his power and his anointing, and would change lives and give life and light to the world. Well, we're going to turn to the word of God now. And um, if you have a Bible with you, could you turn with me, please, to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. The Psalms aren't too difficult to find, are they, in the Bible? If you open it in the middle, you usually hit the Psalms, and uh, then we're in Psalm 46. The title says, For the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. And then verse 1 of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. The Psalms are a lovely book. In it, you can find expression for almost every emotion that you might face in life. Sometimes there's songs of joy that we can shout out and praise the Lord. Other times there's times of doubt where you can bring your doubts to the Lord. Other, other times there's times of sorrow when you've maybe been involved in something wrong. You can turn back to the Lord again. Other times there's times of comfort when we're sad or lonely. There's times where we can know help in time of trouble. And indeed, often in Hebrew poetry, they start off with a conclusion or with a summary. And that's actually quite helpful. Often in our writing, well, 
not that I write very much, I don't really like it. But um, but at the end, we have a conclusion, don't we? Or a summary statement of what's said, being said before. Well, they started with that, which is helpful. So you start with the first verse and it tells you what the rest is all about. And so here we have it. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And it tells us what it's about. It starts off very simply, God is. It doesn't even have to try to defend the existence of God. It's just that God is. And shouldn't we know it? As was read at the start of the, the service this morning, the heavens declare the, the glory of God. You can see it, can't you? The handiwork of God, his design, his existence, his being. God is there. But then it tell, tells us what he is to us. God is our refuge. We know what a refuge is, don't we? I would look back to when I was a child and we used to play tag uh, with friends. You know, you'd try and catch somebody and take them and they were on. And every now and again, when you were playing this game, um, somebody would just say, oh, this is Den. You can't get me now. <laughs> it was usually when they were about to be caught, when they were exhausted and didn't, couldn't get away anymore. It was like, this is Den. You can't get me. It's like a place of safety where they can't be caught, can't be got. Or maybe, you know, when there's a shower of rain, you take refuge or shelter under something. Or have an umbrella, it keeps you dry. You're in a place of refuge from whatever it is. A place of safety. But this tells us that God is our refuge. God is our refuge. When Adam and Eve had disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day in the evening. And he had to ask the question, where are you? To Adam. And what were Adam and Eve doing? They were hiding. Well, you, you can't hide from God. <laughs> that should be fairly obvious, shouldn't it? <laughs> it's like playing hide and seek with a little child. When they're small, you say, coming ready or not. And they're like, here I am. <laughs> And it's like the, the, the whole point is being found. But they were trying to hide from God, trying to seek shelter from God because they knew they had done wrong. But you see, it says we confess our sin and our need of him, that we can find that mercy and forgiveness. So you see, later we can see that God is a, refu a refuge from the judgment of God because God is just. And so when he declared judgment on the world in the time of the flood, there was a way of escape. He told Noah to build an ark, a place of refuge from the judgment, from the storm, from the flood. And Noah preached to the people around that they would come and enter into that refuge, the ark, the place of safety. Sadly, not many did. They didn't find God their refuge. But I encourage us today that we can find a refuge in God. He knows who we are. He knows what we're like. He knows what we have done. He knows that we need him, which is why Jesus came into this world, to be the saviour of the world, to save us from sin. And that there on the cross, the Lord Jesus took the punishment for sin, which was death. The wrath of God was poured out on him so that we can be forgiven. And we can find shelter in coming to Christ. Shelter from our sin because he's taken it and taken the punishment for it. We can find his righteousness so we could make God our refuge today. He offers to be our refuge if we will but come to him. It's like the children of Israel when they were facing the last of the plagues that was on Egypt. To remove their slaves in Egypt and the last one was going to affect everyone, even them. But if they took the lamb and they applied its blood to the lintel and the doorposts, the angel of death would pass over them. They had shelter underneath the sacrifice of the lamb. And we can find shelter from the justice and the wrath of God on our sin when we come to Christ. So we can find him a place of refuge, shelter from the judgment, and we can know peace with God. We can know protect the protection of God if we would find in him our refuge.
but in life, there is trouble, isn't there? Maybe you think life is easy and there's no problems. Oh dear, there's probably going to be a time of trouble coming. <laughs> and life has difficulties, doesn't it? We can have difficulties in our relationships with one another, in family relationships. We can have difficulties in our communities, our workplace. We can have difficulties mentally. We can have difficulties um, in terms of sickness. We can have difficulties financially. And they might only be personal difficulties, personal troubles. Some troubles might be of our own making. Like if you were sent to see the principal in the principal's office, you were in trouble, but probably for something you've done, you probably deserved it. <laughs> yes, a word of experience there too. <laughs> but you learn your lesson, don't you? Or should do. But sometimes there's many troubles that come that aren't our own doing. Maybe we don't know where to turn or what to do. There's trouble, there's difficulty, there's a helplessness. Where can we turn? Or we can turn to Almighty God and find in Him a refuge. We can find in Him not just a refuge, but a strength. <clears throat> if we see a child who's had a fall or been hurt somehow, what do they immediately do? A little child. They'll run to, I was going to say mummy. It usually is mummy, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, run to their parent or whoever's there to, to find that comfort to be picked up, to give, be given that hug and that encouragement, that strength, that protection, to comfort them from what's just happened and to help them to, to go on and carry on with life. But we can find in God our refuge. We can find in him our strength because he is a person. God is real. He can give us that comfort and that strength and that power to keep on living, to keep on going. God is our refuge and strength. He is an ever-present hell in trouble. <clears throat> We're all present here this morning, but we don't use the term very present, are we? It'd be very cheeky if I asked if you were very present, <laughs> or are we very distracted? <laughs> um, <clears throat> but sometimes, you know, you can talk to people, can't you? Or be at the dinner table. I remember sometimes when you're thinking about things and even there sitting at the dinner table, sometimes Janet has said to me, are you with us? <laughs> um, it's like, oh, yeah, yes, I have. I was thinking about something else. <laughs> but, but God is a very present hell. He's not just present. He is very present. He's accessible. He is available. Wherever we are, day or night, geographical location, God is an ever-present hell in trouble. The context of this psalm is often suggested to be written by King Hezekiah, or if not by King Hezekiah, by somebody around that time. Now, King Hezekiah was a good king and did a lot of good in the land and <clears throat> was blessed, but then there was the king of, Assy of the Assyrians had come to attack Jerusalem. His name was Sennacherib. You can read about it. But there were hundreds of thousands of enemy soldiers came and surrounded Jerusalem. People were in fear. They didn't know what to do. Maybe Hezekiah didn't know what to do. And how were they going to overcome the enemy? They didn't have the resources, the manpower or their tools to, to fight. Not physically anyway. And so it's thought that this is written in that context, that there they were helpless in terms of these enemy soldiers that had come. But they found God was their refuge. God was their strength. And God was an ever-present help in time of trouble. And God wrought a marvellous victory and deliverance for his people. Many of the enemy soldiers died overnight, and the rest returned back to their land. Without the people having to fight themselves, God delivered his people. And sometimes we can look at things, can't we, as if they seem like the biggest problems we can't get our heads around them, we can't face them, can't go through them. And yet in the light of who God is, he is far bigger, far more able as someone said, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> and then 
it is all small stuff in relation to God. God is an ever-present help in time, in trouble, in the difficulties that we face. We can find in him a refuge. We can find in him our strength. We can find in him hell throughout life. Then we have a conclusion in verse 2. Therefore, we will not fear. <laughs> That's easier said than done, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe there are some things that make us afraid. In fact, the other a couple of weeks ago, we had um, some, some people around who were playing a game in the lounge. And uh, our little boy who's six was sitting on the floor playing the game and suddenly saw a big spider walking across the floor. Well, <laughs> he wasn't afraid to let people know he was scared. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yes, but therefore we will not fear. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? We can think about the worst that could happen in our situation, but here it tells us, even though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the hearts of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, even if the whole world, as it were, to cave in and collapse and end, he says, therefore, we will not fear. <laughs> it seems surprising, doesn't it? And yet when you get the perspective of, of who God is, that God, by his very voice, spoke the world into being. God always has been and always will be. He is the one who is in control. Even if the earth shakes, even though if the mountains are moved and everything is destroyed, God still is. And he is still an ever-present hell in trouble. Therefore, we do not need to fear. Psalm, sorry, Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. I wonder how we put our faith in Almighty God, that he is the one who is eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful. He's the one who is there, no matter what happens. And even about a situation that we're in right now, he knows, he loves, he cares. And he is present, and he is more than able to meet the demands, if we'll but find in him our refuge and our strength. We were singing before, weren't we, in the lovely words of that hymn from Psalm 130. We will wait, we will cry, out to the Lord when we need him and we need him all the time so in those first few verses we see that God is our refuge a place of shelter someone we can turn to and run to he is there his ear is open to our cry and he is able but then in verse 4 we read that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God there is a river if it was the time of Hezekiah, this psalm was written, and they were besieged by these enemy soldiers from Assyria, well, what can keep a city going? A water source. If they have water in the city, then they can keep on living and facing whatever there is facing them outside the city. But Jerusalem doesn't have a water source, naturally. But King Hezekiah had had a tunnel built to bring water from outside, from the springs of Gihon, I think it was, through to the pool of Siloam within the city. Hardly described as a river, I've never seen it, but it's apparently quite small, but it is a water source. They apparently tunnelled from both ends through solid rock and met in the middle, even though this is hundreds of years before Christ. And um, people can, can walk through it, apparently. Maybe some of you have. But there was a water source in the city to help it to live in the times of besiegement. But the river speaks of life. It speaks of provision. It speaks of blessing. Indeed, Jesus spoke, speaks about those who believe in him. Out of their belly will flow rivers of living water. He spoke of this concerning the Spirit, that God is within them, to give life, to give sustenance, to give help when we need it. And this river makes glad the city of God. 
You know, we have all the provision that we need in Christ. He's given us all we need for life and for godliness. All we need to face the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And the world that we're in too. Mentioned some of the troubles before, didn't we? Personally, but even nationally or internationally. Yes, there's difficulties and problems around. But there's a river that provides what the city needs. But then more significantly than the river is the, the resident who's there. It's where the Most High dwells. God is there. More significantly than the refuge that might be the walls around the city or the river that's within the city is that God is there. And God is that ever-present help in trouble. But God is there. His dwelling with his people. Do you ever feel lonely or alone? Jesus says to his disciples, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We can only be in one place at a time, can't we? Physically anyway. But God is everywhere. But here he's in the city. If they're besieged by enemy soldiers that outnumber them many times over, God is there. He is with them. But we're reminded too of the city that Abraham looked for. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. But he died in faith, looking forward to it. The city we read of in Revelation, the holy city, the new Jerusalem that came down out of heaven from God. There's a city. Jesus spoke about it in John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. And God is there, that where I am, he says, there you may be also. We can have a residence with Almighty God, that we can look forward to being with him forever. So there's a river, and the resident is God himself. Verse 5, God is within her, she shall not fall. And it says God will help her at break of day. Yes, darkness happens at night, but then there's a new day dawning. There's a start of something new, and just at the time of need, God is there, and God is able and present to help. And his help is all we need. <laughs> I remember trying to push a car when I was about five to get it to jump start. Mum and Dad's car wouldn't start. And I tried pushing it and the car didn't move. <laughs> Not surprisingly. But, but then my dad came along and he pushed. And I pushed too. I think I was helping. But <laughs> yes, in comparison, my help probably wasn't very much. But Dad could probably push the car himself. But, you know, God is that help. But if God is our helper, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Do you remember the prophet who, when the enemy, uh, prophet Elijah, when the enemy soldiers were all around, and Elijah's servant said, you know, you know, can't you see all the people here? The prophet prayed that the Lord would open his servant's eyes and actually see that there were far more with them than there were those against them. And you see, with God, it's a majority. If God is with us, well, that changes everything. You can be one person on your own, like Elijah, um, to the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, with about a thousand of the other prophets, 700 of one and, and others there too, all opposing him. And yet God was with him. And God is that help at break of day. Verse 6 says, nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. There's no power and no strength that come against the Lord. They can try, but all the nations are as like a drop in the bucket to Almighty God. You talk about powers or superpowers or all the nations together. Well, all of them are just like a drop in the bucket compared to Almighty God. He is so big. He is so powerful. He is eternal. Our God is mighty. He is almighty. And he is able to help. 
and all he has to do is speak his voice. <laughs> when Jesus was being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, they asked if he was the one that they were looking for. He said, I am. And at the very statement of that word, the soldiers who'd come out against him fell to the ground. They were powerless before God. Jesus is God. At his very voice, they couldn't do anything. This is who old God Almighty is. So whatever we're facing personally, or in our lives locally, or as a church, or as a family, or a community, or as a nation, or the world is facing, well, God is far bigger. As we used to sing in Sunday school in our small, he's got the whole world in his hand. God is so big, and he is so powerful. In verse 8, it says, Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. What a day it would be, wouldn't it, when wars cease, when there's no more striving, when there is world peace. And one day it will happen when the Prince of Peace returns and establishes it himself, when he rules and reigns in righteousness. Isaiah foresees the day when they'll make the, the, the weapons of war into tools for tilling the land. He looks forward to that day. I might think this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And one day he will establish it. He will do it. So come and see the works of God. Who he is, what he has said he will do. He will do. He doesn't say something and isn't able to keep it or forgets. When he says it, it will happen. This is who God is. And so verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes life can be so full of things, can't it? Busyness, stresses, anxiety, worry. Worry, someone described as being like a rocking chair, gives you something to do without getting anywhere. <laughs> but all the stresses and struggles of life, be still and know that I am God. He's the one who's in control. He's the one who's given us life. He knows the end from the beginning. So we can take comfort as a child of God. He tells us to be still. He's got the world in his hands. He's got the situation in his hands. He's got our very lives in his hands. So we can be still and know that he is God. But did you notice a change in the voice in verse 10? Up to that point, it seems to be the psalmists, or ever wrote the psalm, singing and talking about God. But then in verse 10, it's the very voice of God. It's as if in the midst of all that's going on, all this trouble, the nation's roaring and raging and everything that's going on, suddenly God steps onto the sea and he speaks. Be still. And every objection, argument, raging, storm, the earth quaking, everything else just stops. We mentioned before the psalm takes God's existence for granted. But when God steps in, there's no disputing it. You might say, well, <laughs> Yeah, right. How can, how can this happen? Where can we see this? Well, can we, I take you to a little boat on the Sea of Galilee. There's a furious storm in this lake, the Sea of Galilee. Seven of the disciples who were, who were fishermen, the other disciples are there too in this boat, but the wind's howling, the waves are big, the boat's being swamped, it looks like it's going down. Had the disciples forgotten who was in the boat with them? It was Jesus. God was a very present help in trouble. What was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. <laughs> Some of us have trouble, dif difficulty sleeping, don't we, on the, even the calmest of nights. <laughs> but in the middle of a boat, in the middle of a storm, <laughs> such is the peace of God. <laughs> we will not fear. <laughs> What an example of living out this psalm. But then with the wind and the waves and the disciples terrified, 
Do you not care that we are going to drown? They said to him. They thought their end had come, and you don't seem to care about it. They were worked up, worried, anxious. They were in trouble. And what did Jesus do? Well, see how God just steps in. He was there already. <laughs> but he said, peace. And the very words in this psalm here, verse 10. Be still. And the wind stopped. The waves, the waters stopped. And I think the disciples stopped too. <laughs> Maybe from amazement at what had happened. Who is this man? This is Almighty God. And all he has to do is speak. And everything will just stop. Notice what it says here. He speaks and the earth melts. God who spoke the world into existence can speak and everything will cease. But God steps onto the scene here. And be still and know that I am God. Cease from your worrying, your anxiety. Let the nation cease from their raging and roaring and fighting against God. All he has to do is speak and they stop. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. When the Lord Jesus comes back, we're told in Philippians, aren't we, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When God himself returns, yes, when wars will cease, they will know that God is God. But what about people for today? Well, did you notice verse 7 and verse 11 are identical? The Lord Almighty is with us. You know, it said of John Wesley on his deathbed that his last words were, the best of all is that God is with us. Oh, to know God with us. Emmanuel, yes, God with us. But the one who's promised to never leave us, nor forsake us, the one who's promised to be with us always, keeps his word. And he is with us in the midst of our trials, like the disciples in the boat. Jesus was there. But then it says the God of Jacob is our fortress. Why, why does it mention Jacob? <laughs> Well, he's a Lord of hosts, yes, of everything. He's a Lord of all, yes, but he's the God of the individual. But why choose Jacob? Wasn't Jacob a bit of a rebel? Wasn't he a bit of a, a schemer? Yes, indeed, he was. But God wore him down, as it were. God didn't give up on Jacob, but brought him to a place of submission, where his life changed. And here we can see that if we are rebellious, that God calls us to repentance. He calls us to turn and to change. Notice this psalm is of the sons of Korah. Korah was uh, Moses' cousin, but who thought that he should be leader, maybe instead of Moses. He was rejecting God's choice of leader in Moses and wanted to be the leader himself. His rebellion ended when the earth opened up and he was swallowed. The end of his life. But notice that God is also not just ma just, but he is merciful. Because the sons of Korah are now those who are leading the worship in the temple. There is forgiveness for the rebel, for the nations that are raging and roaring against God. He speaks to them, be still. Submit to Almighty God. Find in him a refuge from judgment, from justice. Find in him a refuge to know our sins forgiven. Find in him a refuge from all the trouble and turmoil in life that we face. That we have Almighty God to turn to. To find help in time of need. And strength to keep on going and living when we feel weak and helpless. I will know that there is a river to provide everything that we need in this city whose resident is God, that we can go to be with him forever when this earth does give way. But there is a new heavens and a new earth that God is preparing. And then we can find our rest, to be still and to know that he is God. And we can trust him with life, with the situations we're in, 
and we can trust him with eternity because he is God who is a present help. He is the God who is our refuge and who is our strength. So I trust today in the week ahead and in the rest of our lives we will know Almighty God. We'll be still. Take time to contemplate on who he is and his power, his presence, his purpose in all the turmoil and all the trouble and find in him that refuge and that rest that we can know and know the peace of God that passes all understanding because he is present and he is able.